And uh, I think we're about chapter 22, something like that. I appreciate those good songs tonight. Uh, they certainly were very appropriate for, uh, for our studies. And uh, last week uh, we were talking about the um, Job's response to um, his three buddies. And God deliver all of us from buddies like these. Um, but um, <clears throat> what I've done is I've taken the chapters that deal with Job's response in this last, uh, uh, or in the second uh, series. In other words, there are three rounds of rebuttal from Job's friends. And uh, you have Ilphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Each, they speak. One will speak, and then Job answers. Then another one speaks. Job answers. Another one speaks, and Job answers. Then you get back to the first fellow again, Bildad. He speaks. Job speaks. Bild, and then Ilphaz speaks, and then Job speaks, and then Zophar speaks, and Job speaks. Okay? The, the, uh, responding. This happens three times, with the exception of Zophar in the last one. He runs out of gas. And uh, doesn't get back up to bat. We'll talk about, maybe we'll get to that just a little bit later. But uh, <clears throat> if you, um, and I just want to try to find where I left off last week. Maybe somebody can help me. Um, I believe we had talked about the seed. And I think we're in chapter, um, uh, we moved down to chapter 21. And that is a continuation of uh, Job's response to, uh, <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to his three friends. I mentioned that verse 19 in chapter um, 20, I think it's verse 19, let me just find it, um, is about one of the saddest verses in the Bible. I believe it's verse 19 in chapter 19. Yes, you have in chapter 19, I believe it's verse 19. I call your attention to that. He said, All my inward friends abhor me, and they whom I love have turned against me. Now, the, the thing about this is it wouldn't be quite so sad if Job was a wicked man. If Job had lived a life that deserved rejection, it'd still be wrong. It'd still be wrong, but it would be understandable. But here is a man who has done absolutely nothing wrong. He's a type of Christ. Because you could look and think of Jesus when he's on the cross, and he could be saying the very same words in verse 19. All my inward friends abhor me, and they whom I loved have turned against me. And uh, that was true to a great degree. But in some degree it wasn't as much as it was in Job because John the Beloved still stood by the cross, if you remember, and Mary stood by the cross. But with Job, nobody stood with him. There's nobody stood with him. He'd lost all ten of his children. His wife had, uh, had, had I'm sure, had gotten bitter, and she couldn't understand why he just kept holding out and said, why don't you just curse God and let him kill you? And then the three friends who are religious uh, probably the three best friends he's got, and men of reputation, they come, and they don't have a clue as to what's going on. And uh, <clears throat> so we, uh, we grieve for Job when we think of him, but we think that around the world there have been many men like Job um, who have lost everything. They've lost uh, entire families in tragedies, on like an airplane wreck or... I think I've mentioned to you down in uh, Bakersfield, California area, there was a small church. They took a group of teenagers to a camp. And uh, on the way back, coming down Highway 99 near Bakersfield, a drunken man in a truck uh, passed another car, ran head on into the bus, and uh, caught the bus on fire. And uh, almost everybody on the bus was killed, with the exception, I think, of three kids. 
And in that church, there wasn't one family that didn't have a dead child. Anyone that had any family that had children, one of their kids had been killed. And those whose kids weren't killed, I mean, if they had remained, they felt guilty that they had living children because they had to look around and see so many people grieving. And Brother John Cook has told me, he says, that just devastated that church because folks couldn't handle the grief. Too many people grieving in one family. And uh, here is a man by the name of Job. He's a real person. And he loses his children in one day. You've heard the old story, when it rains, it pours. I'm telling you, that's the book of Job. And because the Bible says, while the one servant was speaking, another came. Another. And while that one was yet speaking, another came. And uh, so I hope that, that we will be able to learn what God would have us to learn from this, uh, from this book. In chapter 21 of the book of Job, <clears throat> Job continues his answer in the second round of answers. And you'll notice that uh, Job uh, chapter 21 verse 1, But Job answered and said, Hear diligently my speech, and let this be your consolation. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken, mock on. As for me, and my complaint is my complaint to man. And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? Mark me, and be astonished, and lay your hand upon your mouth. Even when I remember I am afraid, and trembling taketh hold of me. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, and are mighty in power? Their seed is established in, the sight, in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bulls gender and faileth not, their cows calve and casteth not the calf, her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in the moment uh, go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Now you want to keep in mind that basically these three friends have said this, and this is the philosophy of the world, of, Christ, of the Christian world in many cases. They have said, Job, God always punishes the wicked and the righteous prosper. God blesses the righteous. The wicked he punishes. You're being punished. Therefore, guess what? You're wicked. They were wrong. They were dead wrong. But I am telling you, the world thinks the same way today. In Jesus' day, a blind man, they saw a blind man, and the disciples asked the question, Who did sin that this man was born blind? Him or his parents? And Jesus said, Neither. Neither. In fact, he said something that's astonishing. He said, this blindness is for the glory of God. See, but you can't, you have a hard time accepting that. See, we have been so conditioned by a false Christianity that we believe that only good things are from God, and, or good things are from God and bad things are from the devil. That's what we think. We think anything that's bad can't be from God. And anything that's good can't be from the devil. But I am telling you, it can be either way, and the problem is you can't know which. There's the problem. That is the problem. The problem of life is when I am being blessed, is it God or the devil? And the problem of life is when I'm having difficulty, is it the devil or is it God? Now, if I'm violating some rules, and, and if I am, you know, if I keep getting traffic tickets because I drive 40 in a 20 mile, then I, I don't have to. It's neither God or the devil. It's a demon. It's me. You understand? So there are things that we bring upon ourselves which are self-evident. But many things in life are not evident. And then there's the problem. When you have a problem in church with somebody or with your family, when you have a problem, is the devil trying to get you out of the church or is it God trying to lead you somewhere else? Okay? Okay. Well, if you want to go, you say it's the Lord trying to lead you somewhere else. If you don't want to go, or if you'd like to go and you're mad at somebody, you say it's the devil. Say so just, just any way you want to play the game. 
You understand? We stack the deck to suit ourselves. But when we know what the Bible says, we realize that we're crooked when we stack the deck. That's called cheating. It's called being crooked. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So then these buddies of Job, they have said in their philosophy, in their creed, the righteous prosper. We tell people, you get saved and everything will go okay. It might and it might not. But you can't tell people everything's going to be okay if they get saved. You don't know. You don't know that. They might, might not. You tell a man, boy, if you don't, you don't get saved, you're going to get in trouble. He may laugh at you and not have any trouble till the judgment. You don't know. Those are not motives necessarily. So then here in chapter 21, Job re refutes that philosophy. And that's what he's saying here in chapter 21 if you watch what goes on. And uh, these men ha are espousing what we call the doctrine of retribution. And it should be clear by now that the doctrine of retribution is firmly held by Job's friends. It was held by our Lord's disciples and is ignorantly held today by believers and unbelievers alike. We, t we scare our kids. You should never use this as a whipping post. You know, well, the devil's going to get you. you see? What if they get by? This made a fool out of you. See? See? Well, the devil's going to get you. Well, he might and he might not. You don't know. That's not a good way to, that's not, you know, God's going to get you. He might. He might not. Might. You might sail right on by. You may squeak right up, slick right up to the judgment seat. Okay? Now, you won't get by it. You won't get by the judgment seat. But you may get right through life. And, uh, and you might and you might not. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't gamble. I mean, I wouldn't play roulette with life. Because there's one chamber that's loaded, you know, and it'll get you. So as a prime example, a prime example of what we mentioned here is the man who was born blind, who was blind from birth. And Jesus passed by and saw uh, the man which was blind from birth. And his disciples said to him, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So when you have a baby that's born disfigured, you know, the first thing you might be able to think is the devil caused this. Or God caused it. You don't know who caused it. That's the whole thing again. You don't know who caused it. But you need to say, how can I turn this thing into a blessing and use it to glorify God? How can I take this and glorify God? That's the key. The key is not so much who did it. The key is what you're going to do with it. You understand? That's the key. You may not be able to avoid scars. You, you can't avoid adversity and difficulty. It will come your way. You say, who's at fault? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What are you going to do with it? That's the thing. If you found out who was at fault, you couldn't do anything about it anyway, could you? So the thing to do is to take it and use it for God's glory. And this is the lesson most folks don't learn. You know, if you blame the devil for everything, you'll never get the lesson God's trying to teach you. And I, I, I just heard some overheard some folks talking the other day, and they're trying to blame the devil for some, something that's happening in somebody's life. Well, maybe. But I wouldn't blame the devil for everything. Maybe God's trying to say something to you through adversity. Maybe God's trying to say something to you through adversity. But if you blame everything on the devil, then God can never say anything to you. Say, I mean, maybe God put you on your back. Maybe God put you in a hospital. You say, oh, he wouldn't do that. Well, uh, he allowed the best of believers to go to jail. He allowed the best of believers to go to the chopping block. He allowed the best man to ever live to go to a cross. So why would you think you're exempt? I mean, the best believers went to the rack, and God allowed it. You say he couldn't stop it? He could have stopped it. Why didn't he? I don't know. I don't worry why. The thing is, you glorify God on the rack. That's all you do. Don't worry about why. 
That's Job. That's his three friends for this whole 42 chapters trying to answer why. And they missed it a million miles. You know why you don't know why? Because you can't hear the conversation that's going on in heaven. That's why you don't know. Why did I have cancer at uh, 31 years old? I don't know. I know I did. And if I can use it for glo God's glory, then so be it. That's all you do. That's all you do. I'm not going to sit around and try to worry about who gave me cancer. Was it, did God allow it or did the devil do it? I'm going to worry about it. Or was it something I ate or didn't eat? I'm not going to worry about it. I just want to use it and thank God that he gave me some more life, that he spared my life, and that I can help other people who have cancer. I can encourage them. That's all. It's what Corinthians, 2 Corinthians says, that the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulation that we